Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. Good morning. It is such an amazing privilege and honor to be with you. I am a little nervous. I didn't know that we had to compare ourselves in terms of our dress code to Russell. Oh my goodness, both you and he are such studly young looking guys and I'm just old, I think. I, you know, I tell people, young people, I, you know, I used to be a youth minister and they look at me like, how can this be? That guy's kind of old. Oh, what a, what a treat on this weekend to see so many faces. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for making church a priority. Uh, your pastor has become a dear friend, and when he called and he said, hey, would you be available? I said, absolutely, without a doubt, would be honored to be here and to share with you. Uh, so many faces in the, uh, in the sanctuary are recognizable to me, and I would start to rattle them off, but I would miss the important ones, and then I would be in trouble big time. I will, though, tell on my friend Shorty right here, he said, hey, Dave, if you get in a jam and you need my help, I'm going to stand in for you. And I'm almost thinking about stepping down to hear Shorty preach. I mean, that's got to be worth something there. Yeah, come on. <laughs> he would do it. He would do it. I, uh, uh, Julie and myself and our kids, um, when we came to Dripping Springs in 94, found a community that we fell in love with. And now uh, going on 28 years later, so if you are new to the Dripping Springs area, you have moved to the best place on the planet. I know that I'll have to apologize to all the people watching online that are in our Austin churches or Pflugerville or Round Rock or these kinds of things. But it is an amazing community, and you have found a tremendous church home here. I want to thank you for the tremendous job that your worship team did today. Um, I'm a big fan of Spotify, and on Sunday mornings, I get my vehicle cranking with good Christian tunes. I'm telling you, your team could have easily filled in for the Spotify folks today and uh, been blessed in an amazing way. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we just want to look at three verses today, and I've entitled my sermon, as you see on the screen, The Outworking of Faith, Hope, and Love. I don't think I had thought about this passage so much until of recent days went to a funeral. And at the funeral... The, uh, the fellow referenced a guy by the name of Blake Johnson who said in life there are three grand essentials. And I'm taking this from Blake Johnson's podcast on February the 2nd, 2018. He says that in our lives we need something um, in three different dimensions. Number one, he says we need something to pursue. Something to do on a daily basis that requires you to get up, to get dressed, go to work and accomplish a task. We need something to love, whether that's a person, an object, a hobby, or something else. And then we need something to hope for, like a better life or a romantic relationship or some kind of a new experience. And so if you're keeping track, something to pursue, something to love, and something to hope. Now, I've not met uh, Mr. Johnson before, but it reminded me of a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, but it also reminded me of a scripture verse, a single scripture verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we have dubbed the love chapter. A lot of times you go to weddings and you'll, you'll hear people talk about love is patient and kind and all these kinds of things. And uh, we pastors typically make an excuse, well, nobody can do that. Hopefully your spouse will try some of those, you know, something like that. But the reality is it talks about God's kind of love. And then in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. The three essentials, the three, the three necessities, the three indispensable qualities that we as believers need to have in our life are faith, hope, and love. So let me read for you. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 to 24. Beginning in verse 22, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Verse number 23, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to do acts of love and good works. What are the essentials? What are those things that are inherent? What are indispensable? The three basic behaviors or disciplines of a Christian are faith, hope, and love. And at the beginning of each of those verses, it has that word, let us, let us, let us. Those are, if you will, marching orders or commands for us as believers. And so if you're taking notes this morning, just put down a one, three, one, two, three, and here we go. Number one, a Christian at the outworking of their faith does faith, has faith, experiences faith. It says they go right into the presence of God. Some other translations use this word. They approach God. They draw near to God. But what does it say? Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. So one of the most significant ways you and I enter into the presence of God is in prayer. We commune, we relate to, we fellowship with God in prayer. How often in your daily life do you spend time seeking the Father? How often do you spend time studying his word? If you and I are to believe be all that God would have us to be, then our life is typified by faith. What is faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 8 and verse, or excuse me, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And it's important that we spend time in God's word. During the time that we were here in Dripping Springs, my parents moved here. My dad was uh, at one point in time the mayor of Dripping Springs. And uh, man, it was it was just great to have access to the mayor. I was hoping he would cut me little side deals a little bit better than anybody else, but I had to follow all the rules like everybody else did. But one of the things that my dad would tell me regularly when I would go to him and I'd say, hey, can you give me some counsel? What should I do about this? Two things he'd say. Have you prayed about it? And what has God told you in his word? Now, I know as a minister, I'm not supposed to tell you these things, but there were times when I said, Dad, I'm just kind of in a gym. Can you just kind of give me some cheats here? Can you kind of help me? What should I do? And he said, Dave, there's no short, there's no shortcut in your life. If you want to live your life in a way that you are God-directed, if you want to live your life by faith, then you and I, we need to enter into the presence of God in prayer and through reading his word. Last summer, I was invited by some friends to, to go up into Colorado and to some, spend some time in their cabin. Never had done this in my life. And uh, especially for me, it was a little bit challenging because there was no running water. There were no uh, facilities. There's no electricity. And uh, after about 10 hours, I thought I was about to lose my mind because there was nobody else to talk to. And imagine this, my cell phone didn't work. There was no coverage anywhere. By about day and a half into this process, it was an incredible time of me with the Lord. And here's what was amazing about it that I hadn't anticipated. It was more me listening to God than talking to God. And it really helped to revolutionize my prayer life because a lot of times when I go to the Lord in prayer, it's something like this. Just smile at me. Don't raise your hand if you've ever had this kind of thing. I'll pick on my friend Pam here. Dear God, I know Pam's probably praying to you right now. My problems are really big. Go ahead and put Pam on hold. And please, Lord, just pay real close attention. We need some action right here in my stuff. None of you have all ever done that, I know. But there are some times when I do that, and I'm talking, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. And rather than allowing the Lord to speak back and for me to hear him, I'm just talking, I'm just talking the whole time. I am just rattling, rattling, rattling off. And if I'm to grow in this thing called faith, it's going to come as I spend time in the presence of God. 
Now, this morning, my lovely wife, Julie, was not able to be with me. I tell her sometimes it's good that she doesn't come. She's so youthful looking that when we're, with, when we're together with my exceedingly white hair, everybody asks if this is my daughter. I used to be bothered by that. Now I just tell everybody I'm a really smart old guy. It's especially bad when our daughter Bethany's there. So, oh, this is your daughter and your granddaughter. No, no, no. One of the things I enjoy doing is spending time in her presence. And think of it this way. When you're spending time with someone, it's not just a one-way street. You're talking and they're not talking. There's a communication going on. Those Christians who were experiencing Christian life to its fullest find themselves in the presence of God. But number two, they hold tightly without wavering to the hope they affirm in Christ. I looked at some other translations of Scripture, and it says Christians, they hold tightly, they capture, they catch, they seize, they apprehend. They hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Hope answers the question, what could be? And as believers in Christ, we ought to have the greatest hope of anybody on the planet. Why? Because we know that ultimately Christ returns for those of us who know him and our hope is in him. So let me give you a definition of what I believe hope is. Hope is the cord that connects us to God. The very thing that enables God to work in our lives. Repeatedly, the, the psalmist David points to the power and the benefits of hope. Listen to what he says in Psalm chapter 25 and verse 3. No one who hopes in you, God will ever be put to shame. He goes on to say in Psalm chapter 33, verse 18, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love. Now, hope goes beyond wishing. Hope is believing. It's expecting. It's anticipating a reality yet to come. But hope is not just something that's out there, it's an understanding, it's a belief that God is working and moving in our lives. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. That is our hope. So let me tell you at least three things that hope does in your life and mine. Number one, hope heals. Just as your body needs rest to recover from injury, so does our wounded spirit. Psalm chapter 62 and verse 5. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from you. Another way to say it is this. Hope makes us strong. Hope enables us to develop our spiritual muscles and to combat whatever comes our way because we've seen God work in the past and we know that he's going to step in and he's going to work in the future as well. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 2. I know I'm giving you a lot of verses here but they just speak of what we're talking about. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Hope not only heals, but secondly, hope anchors your faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 say this, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't. Hope heals, hope anchors our faith, but most especially, hope is a gift from God. Anybody love getting gifts? Any of you ever receive a gift from somebody and say, you know what, I'm so sorry. I've just received too many gifts. I can't take anything else. No more. Quit it. We don't do that. But here's what God says in terms of hope for us. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. In fact, I'm probably pretty safe territory in guessing that you probably have a plaque in your house that has this verse on it. Listen to what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And when you look at your life, even when the difficulties happen, you know that ultimately that somehow God is going to work through this and that hope is a gift I love seeing this gift, especially in my senior adult friends. And I can, I get it, Dave, you are one. I'm getting closer every day. 
But those who have a relationship with Christ, they know that no matter what comes their way, there's a confidence that God is on the move. So we are, as Christians, to have faith. We are to have hope. But ultimately, it is love that sets the table. Now, before I left this morning, Julie, again, reviewed my notes with me. And by the way, anything good was when I followed her lead. Anything bad was when I went off script there. She said, spend a lot of time on point number three. Not only are we going to spend a lot of time on point number three, but we're going to get out early. So, I mean, I don't look like Russell. I don't preach as good as Russell, but at least you'll be out early. So you're going to get something out of it. What does it say, number three, that we should do? They... Those that are growing in their relationship with God, they think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Now, I, as you can tell, when I read scripture, a lot of times I'll take other translations. And for for me, uh, growing up, it seemed like King James was the one that we all read all the time, memorized most of my verses that I know in the King James. And uh, it talks about stirring up, spurring on people toward good works. It talks about calling into action, talks about movement forward. And in fact, in one translation, it says that we are to provoke one another to love and good deeds. And I always had a difficult time with this. Whenever I was provoking somebody, that was not a positive thing. I had a younger brother. I was always provoking him, you know, always getting into a tussle with him. But to provoke someone means to encourage them in love. And I want to spend some time here because I think if 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 we as believers could be better examples of love to the world around us, that would be the attraction point to Jesus. The attraction point to Jesus. How important is love? Well, the 10 commandments can be captured in two laws, loving God and loving your neighbor. How do I know that? Well, Jesus summarizes it in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark chapter 12. Here's what he says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So if our life is to be an outpouring of faith, hope, and love, And hope, or excuse me, and love is literally, if you can think of it this way, the atmosphere of our life. Everything that we do, everything that we are, every way that we experience is motivated and directed by love. How do we motivate people? How do we motivate one another to acts of love and good needs? Well, two ways. We love God and we love our neighbors. We love God and we love our neighbors. So by loving God, let me ask you this question. Do others see your apparent love for God displayed on a daily basis? Let's get real personal. How about your spouse? Does your spouse see loving God as a priority of your life? How about your children? How about your grandchildren? If your grandchildren were to to describe you, grandpa, grandma, or whatever your grandma and grandpa name is, Do they see you motivated by a love for God? Is your relationship with God prioritized in everyday life? Both my parents, both my in-laws have gone on to be with the Lord. And what a tremendous honor, but at the same time, a pretty incredible uh, responsibility to kind of lead out in all of their services. But in every one of those services, at least one of the grandkids said, Uncle David, I would like to get up, or in the case of my kid's dad, I'd like to get up and talk about how that grandmother or granddad or grandma or grandpa prayed with me or read the Bible with me or helped me understand how important Jesus was in their life. Folks, it is absolutely significant that those in our family see the priority of God in our actions. Julie spoke at her mother's service and talked about the times when she would get up in the morning and she would see her mom drinking a cup of coffee and opening and reading God's word and the impact that it played on her life. 
See, our relationship with God will be revealed by our priorities. So let me ask you a tough question that I asked myself. I watched a bunch of football yesterday. Did I or could I spend an equal amount of time in God's word? I'm not a big Facebook person. If you have a birthday, you're going to get welcomed at about 5 in the morning, and then I don't watch Facebook until 5 the next morning kind of a thing. But am I spending the amount of time in prayer and Bible reading that I do on FaceTime and TV time? And I want to share with you that if we want to show life, if we want to show love, it grows out of a relationship with God. And if our relationship with God is out of sync, every other relationship will be out of sync. Let that, let that uh, re resonate for just a moment. If my relationship with God is where it needs to be, then that means that all the other relationships underneath that have a possibility of kind of working out. That's what it means for us to love God. Are the people that we coming into contact with, are they seeing freaked out, stressed out people all the time? Or are they seeing people who have an unwavering commitment to the Lord? And believe me, people are watching our lives. We have begun a process of trying to learn all of our neighbors. And uh, there's an app called Bless Every Home. And uh, on your particular street, you can put in your house and it will tell you the people that are on the title that own that particular house. Uh, you got to be careful with that because we've been calling people by names when we really didn't know who they were. And if somebody else owned the house, it made it a little bit weird. Why are you calling me John and Sue and we're really this or that? But it's kind of fun to connect with your neighbors. We live on a cul-de-sac and so we'll walk around and we'll see people and we, we begin to get to know who they are. And it's really interesting. You can imagine in the world in which we live when they figure out that I'm some kind of a ministerial pastor person. That's kind of scary. Nobody wants to talk to that guy anymore. Except that with one of our neighbors, we began to develop a relationship. And I'm not coming heavy on to him about you need to do this or you need to do that or this is what God's word said. I just want to develop a relationship with him. And his mom gets sick. And he seeks me out. And he said, David, would you pray for my mom? And I said, absolutely, I'd be honored to. I believe that in him inviting me into that, we're going to have an opportunity to begin to open the door to share Christ with he and his wife and, and their little boy at some point in time. Are we loving God and we love our neighbors? Now, do you know what the word neighbors means in the original language? It means the near ones. So the near ones for me, that would be Julie, my wife, then my son Thompson, his wife Hope, our granddaughter Marley Jo, and then my daughter Bethany, and then the people around my street, the people that I work with. And how are we doing on loving our neighbors? And a lot of times we say, well, I'm doing pretty good with my family and friends, but man, those people that are driving me nuts in my life, no way. But some of the best ways to show love is by responding lovingly, lovingly to those people that are offensive to me. What does it mean to love your neighbor? First of all, you got to know their name. Do you know the names of your neighbors? Do you know a little bit about their story as to where they come from and why they live in your particular neighbor? And have you learned ways to serve them? Now, one of the ways that I love to serve our neighbors, if they're going through so. Uh, a tough time. Uh, we like to send them Tiff treats. I've got this new solution. It works out really well. I send Tiff treats to my neighbors, and then I also send Tiff treats to me. It's like a double blessing. Thank you, God, for just no reason. Hey, listen, your child graduated from you know kindergarten, and we just want to tell you, hey, congratulations. Here's some Tiff treats cookies, and we're loving our neighbors. My wife is like, love your neighbors on steroids. So one of our favorite places to go to eat is Chili's. And I know that's not, you know, really hip and cool, but that was where, well, I've got thumbs up back here, right there. Um, but this is where we went on our first date. And, uh, you know, it's so sad. It's so long ago. They don't even order. I mean, you can't even order the chicken sandwich, grilled chicken sandwich that we ordered on our first date, but that's okay. The restaurant's still around. When they tear down Chili's, it's going to be bad, I'm telling you. 
So we're at Chili's, and, and I'm just taking a page out of Julie's playbook as to how you can love your neighbor well. So the lady that was serving us, her name is Brianna. Now, you already know, if we know the server at Chili's, something's going good here. So Julie's saying, oh, Brianna, thank you so much. You're just such a great servant. A lady as beautiful as you, are you married? No, I'm not. I have a boyfriend right now, but we really don't have a lot of money to get married. And so we're not going to get married for a while. And Julie says, not a problem. My husband right there, he is a minister. He'll do your wedding and he'll do it for free. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, what's going on? So we decided that we would do the wedding on the Capitol. Um, I was almost going to have to be the wedding singer and the wedding person and the videographer, but we got some other people, so it wasn't a total disaster. But it would not be unusual for me this afternoon to get a text from Brianna saying, hey, keep praying for Ralph and me and what's going on in our life. They're currently you know, looking to have, have a little one and... It's just amazing when we love our neighbors, when we love the people that God brings into our sphere of influence, the Lord really opens the door. Now, eventually, they'll find their way to Sunset Canyon and to the youth group and this kind of thing. But, you know, some, one of the ways in which we share the love of Christ is just by living life in a way that's unique and different, not weird. You don't have to go, go all John the Baptist on us and go eat chocolate-covered locusts and those kinds of things. But just love and care for your neighbor. So let me ask you this morning, in looking at your life, is that faith component, is that hope component, but especially this morning, is that love component there? I love prayer. In fact, this morning, stopped by one of our churches and one of my pastors who just, he can't help but tease me. He said, Smith, are you going to preach on prayer again? I go, no, going off script. I'm going to preach on another whole different passage of scripture. But one of the things that I found in prayer is this. Almost anybody will allow you to pray for them. But I do this. I say, what can I pray for you or how can I pray for you? Now, this morning, I didn't, I didn't follow my normal route. I didn't get by my office, but I have an armband that says God is big enough. And I use it because if I can't figure out how to wedge my words into the conversation, somebody always kind of comments on that. I keep it on this arm because when I go through a drive through I kind of put it up on the window so that they can see it. And I am so shameless that at times, if the person in the window is not paying attention to me, I will say these words. Oh, I noticed that you looked at my bracelet, which that makes them look at my bracelet. And I said, oh, I wear that because God is big enough. Is there anything that I can pray for you today? And as I told you, my routine's a little bit out. I love going to Einstein's Bagel. I love their vanilla hazelnut drip coffee. It is so good. You should try it. Do you guys have an Einstein's out here? One. Okay, go. I'm just telling you, you're going to like it. You don't need to put anything in it. It's great flavor. And I will literally go into Einstein's Bagel and the manager lady says, oh, the prayer guy. She doesn't even know what I do. And I said, how can I pray for you all today? And it's really cool because now it's at the point, no kidding, everybody bows their heads, poor people in the drive-thru, hold on a second, we're getting prayed for in here. Pray for health, pray for this, pray for this, and I just pray for them. And I have no idea what God or how God's going to work. But imagine this, all of us here today, we have a sphere of influence that we operate in. People that you're going to meet that I'm not going to have an opportunity to meet. Are we showing the the love of Christ to them? And here's what's going to happen. At some strategic point, they're going to say something like this. "Why, Why are you doing this? What's that all about? And you're going to say something like this. Well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it literally has transformed my life. And he loved me so very much that he gave his life for me. And you know what? I just cannot imagine not sharing with people the most incredible thing that has ever happened in my life. Now, I have people regularly tell me, they go, oh, my goodness, but I'll, I'll screw it up. I'll mess it up. I won't get it right. I go, man, if they don't know Jesus, you're not going to mess it up any more than they already are. 
Just take an opportunity, step into it, and take an opportunity to share the love of Christ with those people. And that's what your pastor's heart is. And that's what I love about him. He wants to be a light. He wants to be salt. He wants to be a testimony to this community and as far as God would reach for you all to share Christ. What a blessing. Thanks for sharing with us about this young person. Comes to a youth event and it it gives their life to Jesus Christ. I mean, wow, how much is that worth? I don't know, a gazillion dollars maybe? That's what we're here for, and that's why the outworking of faith, hope, and love are so significant in our life.